and um, and the weight that that comes on. So Pastor Phil's going to come up. Some of our a couple of our leaders are going to come up, and we're going to lay hands on them. You guys stretch out your hands, and uh, we're going to lift up our our, our pastor in, uh, in prayer. So guys, real quick, you know, a lot of times uh, we see pastors up in churches and we think, we think everything is good with them because they're pastors and they know the word. But there's a lot of spiritual attack um, on everybody, really, and, and especially the leaders, especially the people that are having a spiritual effect on someone's life. And so we want to just be in agreement. So if you guys could uh, lay out your hands so we can lay hands on Phil and just pray for him. Okay. <clears throat> Father God, we just come before you, Lord, confessing our sins right now, Lord. If there's anything hindering this prayer, Father, we want to lift it to you and ask that you would cleanse our hearts, Lord, that you would hear this prayer, Father, for our Pastor Phil. Lord, we thank you for him, Lord, the dedication uh, of studying and giving us the word, Lord. I, I, just, I just pray, Lord, that we would just continue to lift him up, Lord, that you would bring him to our remembrance, that we would pray for him, Lord, as there's spiritual attack on his life, Lord, and his just... Uh, uh, the family, Lord, just all that goes on, Lord. We know that the enemy is real. We know that he wants to divide, destroy, and confuse, Lord. But you're not the author of confusion, Lord. So we have our hope in you and in your word and by your spirit, Lord. So continue to fill him, Lord. Continue to use him, Lord. Thank you for him, Lord. His faithfulness, again, just teaching us and giving us the word that we can understand, Lord. So go with him, Lord. Uh, empower him tonight, Lord. And speak to each of our hearts that we would be open and Lord, we know that spiritual attack is real. And Lord, I know there's people out there too that are going through it. So Lord, we want to lift up each other to you, uh, sharpening each other up in your word and your truth. Lord, so go your, have your way. Um, your will be done in his life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I received that. Thank sure. you, bros. I mean, hey, we're, we're in a war. All of us, right? I mean, it's the, the battle for the soul and the battle for, uh, for our peace, even. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing but by everything, prayer and supplication, right? And, and let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus, man. And that's the peace that he wants us to have. And he... He has it, and it's our flesh, though, man. It's this, it's this, it's this flesh, weak. And uh, Paul, as he's in prison, man, says, "Rejoice!" You know, he's locked up, man. He's experiencing major trials, but yet he teaches about peace and joy. So we know that there's joy in, in the in the morning. We know there's joy in the in the suffering. And and in the and then in the flesh, guys, all of us. I, I like what I like what Paul said when he said, "I see another law at work in me, a law warning warring against my spirit, to bring my my mind into the captivity of evil." He says, "I see that law at work in me." Every, that's every one of us in this room. Every one of us, we have that war happening, man. It's heavy. It's heavy, and I don't know, but I know a lot of you guys, and I know a lot of you guys who are going through it too, man. And so we're praying for each other because the enemy wants to sift every single one of us to take us out of this walk that we're in and, and then to distract you. Uh, uh, I was just listening to a message recently and the other day, and he was talking about, I uh, mentioned that verse I just did, be anxious for nothing. Um, he, he said that word there means to be torn apart. So meaning when we're feeling these, the war, the battle, you know, the pressure of, of the weight of the walk that we're in, he's saying you're really being torn in two. You're being ripped apart inside. And sometimes that's what it feels like, man. It feels like you're, you're, you're just like, gosh, you're being torn inside, right? And he's saying, don't, no. And then the, he, the contrast to that is the word peace. You know, that peace is the opposite of that being torn inside. And as a matter of fact, that word in the scripture, the peace that he gives unto us, that word means tranquility. That's exactly what it means. To, it says freedom from worry. All 
Oh, right on. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Uh, free, freedom from worry. That's, think about that. Are we free from worry? You know, that's heavy, man. I want it. I know you guys want it. We got to pray for it. So, so I appreciate the prayers, man. Uh, we, I need it. We all need them. We need, we need prayer because uh, that's what he says. After he says, be anxious for nothing. By everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Thanking God for what he's done, for the victories we have, the changed lives that we're all living, man, that's heavy. And when you thank him, it activates your faith. It quickens your faith and it reminds you of who God is. That's what he told the children of Israel to do. Mark these times, put memorial stones here. So that way when your kids are older, you can look back and see who I am. <laughs> you know, that's, that's an awesome, the testimony of God. So let's pray because I said we're going to read a chapter. I don't even know what I was thinking when I said that. <laughs> I, I, who am I kidding, man? I mean, I, I, read, I read verses with you guys, and then I go and say, we're going to read a chapter, but you know what? I don't know if you might be able to do it. So let's, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight. And yes, Lord, we want to receive your victory. We want to receive your power. Lord, we want to receive your peace in this very complicated world, perplexed world we live in. And Lord, as we battle, uh, as we are in war, you say it. It's, Paul did the best description this is spiritual warfare but lord you have paid the price you are victorious and help us in our minds to see that and to have that expectation of your power and your presence showing up in our lives and to have an expectation of setting our mind that yes you are with us you are here so lord heal tonight in this room we pray heal our minds heal our bodies lord we ask that you would strengthen us we want to be able to say that uh, we stand by being upheld by the right hand of our God. So, Lord, let that be a let that be a truth to us. And, Lord, for those of us we believe that we believe right now, but we want to say, help thou us in our unbelief. Sometimes we get we get frail. But, Lord, the word says you are faithful even when we are faithless. And we thank you for that. So, Lord, let us hear you tonight through your word in Jesus name. Amen. All right, chapter 36, where we left off. Big old chapter about genealogy. How many of you guys read it? <laughs> A few of you. <laughs> you saw, oh, it's one of those chapters. Eh? <laughs> you know, I, honestly, bro, I, I don't know how many times I've done that too. Or you, especially, some of you guys prepare for studies too. I know a lot of you guys are in ministry or... You'll, you know, then when you come across a genealogy, you're like, oh, man. You know, imagine if, if, the, if, if somebody came up to you and said, hey, I want you to teach tonight, man. Do chapter 36. <laughs> See what you guys say. You know what I mean? Uh, but, but genealogies are powerful. They say a lot. They mean a lot. And so tonight's chapter... For those of you who read it and those of you who will read it tonight, you'll see that it's in regards to Esau. So there's so much meaning behind this genealogy, so much aftermath, if you will, that we're getting into tonight. And we're going to see it described to us. So it starts off by saying, now these are the generations of Esau who was in Edom. That alone right there says a whole lot. If, if anything that we're going to take from this chapter tonight is never forget Esau is of Edom. Never forget that. The rest of the time you read the Bible, for those of you who are going to move on and some of you might get into Bible college or something or some of you just are going to continue to study. Always remember this. I remember at one men's ministry night, we went over Esau being Edom, an Edomite, being the, fa the founder of Edom. It's very important to know that for the rest of the scripture, because Esau becomes an enemy of God. And I shared about this, I don't know, a few weeks back when we were talking about some things about Esau. I kind of went into it a little bit. As a matter of fact, when I shared on a, on a Wednesday, I did a whole study on it about uh, the Amalekites. And, and we're going to see where they come from. And it's very important for us as Bible readers to understand who is Esau, who are the Edomites, who are the Amalekites and why are they so significant in the rest of the scripture reading? Why does God actually say that that uh, the Amalekites and and 
the, the Edomites, by gener he will war with them from generation to generation. I mean, that's heavy, bro. For the Lord to say that about somebody. Put your last name there for a minute. God's going to war with you for generation to generation. You know, like, man, what would cause God to say such a thing about a, a family, about a person, about who they are as a people? And we find that God and the scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit teaches us these things because, well, Edom, Esau, the Amalekites, and so on and so forth are a type of the flesh. They, they are always pictured now in the remainder of the scripture as a type of flesh. And I've recommended to a lot of you that book uh, called The Saving Life of Christ by Ian Thomas. Chapter 9 or 8 of that book is all about actually chapter 36 of Genesis. And it describes, it really does a, a real good slow drawn out picture of what it means for Esau to be a type of the flesh. He was known that it was going to be this way from the beginning. And so when we read this chapter, let's say, let's look at it like that. Let's not look at it like Esau, but let us, let's look at it like a type of the flesh. For example, let's look at verse two. It says, Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. First of all, he should have never done that. Because the Bible said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, do not take Canaanite women to be your wives. Straight up. It doesn't get any more clear than that. Deuteronomy 7, 3. Do not take Canaanite women to be your wives. And what does Esau do? He takes Canaanite women to be his wives. Why? Because the flesh, the flesh does that kind of stuff. <laughs> the Bible says not to do this. Oh, and the flesh goes ahead and, do, and, and it does it. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 8 and 7, where he's saying, the things that I want to do for God, I don't do. <laughs> the things that I, I don't want to do, I do. <laughs> and that's, and that's the, the, the war that Paul's talking about, because that's the war of the flesh. That's the, the life of its ugliness that exists in every single one of us, man. We, we, we want to serve the Lord. We, we want to obey all his commandments. We want to live right. We want to be able to have discipline our eyes, you know? We want to be able to discipline our ears and what we listen to and what we watch. But guess what? Go ahead and turn that movie on and you're just stuck on it. Man, that movie's good, man. This song is bad right here, man. What? No, I don't want to listen to it. That's the flesh. Oh, but man, I, oh, I like that one part. Or, you know, we just can't. Our flesh is just stuck to it, man. You just like it. You love it. it, it it's what the inner man wants. He wants to do that which God doesn't want to do. And that's Paul's very amazing description of the flesh battle in Romans chapter 7 and 8. That's what it is. So here we see Esau taking wives of the Canaanite women, something he was not supposed to do. Don't intermarry. God said, don't do this. It's going to produce forth a repercussion of your generations for the rest of your lives. Don't intermarry with these with the Canaanite women, they're not my people. And then, of course, this, uh, this can go right into what it means to be unequally yoked. What it means to have yourself involved with, whether, with somebody of the world. Whether it's through relationships, whether it's through business, whether it's through whatever, man. And I'm not saying like we are to be like a commune or whatever, only exchanging Christian money with each other. I, I get there's a... A fine line to that. But the point is, is if God is speaking to you and speaking to your heart about a relationship, right? And that's why we always, you hear Calvary pastors say it all the time. Do not be unequally yoked, <laughs> you know, because God doesn't want this mixture to happen. You can't be living, one can't live. And some of you brothers, I pray for because you're experiencing that. Maybe you're right with the Lord and your girl's not. And that's hard, man. I know brothers who deal with that. And, and have been living it for years. Gosh, I couldn't even imagine, man. You know, my chick's at the club or whatever, and I'm over here at a Bible study. Oh, my gosh. I go nuts. But it's real, and it happens all the time. And, and, and then you have this, but you see, but what, what this is really referring to is those of you who are, who are maybe single, or let's say you're dating or whatever, hey, man, make sure you don't get unequally yoked. Well, like Jeff always says, I'll get her saved, man. No. <laughs> No, don't, that, that's not it. That's not going to work. You know, we got to watch out for that stuff. But my example that I'm using here in looking at, the, we're going to look at the rest of the chapter this way. 
where you're going to see Esau, a type of the flesh, and you're going to see examples all throughout this whole genealogy that, that means so much to us. And then look at the next part of verse 2. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholabamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. It's pretty good, huh? <laughs> All right. Ada, this girl, I want to give you guys another example. Ada, here. That's a real interesting name to mention there, his wife. Uh, reason is because she is the mother of Amalek. Okay, who later becomes an enemy of God, the children of Israel, the Am Amalekites attack them. Why that's so interesting is because Ada was the name of a woman in Genesis chapter 4, verse 19, married to a man named Lamech. And this man named Lamech was a man who rebelled against the Lord. And so what's interesting, why, why I think this is really interesting, is because you find in another genealogy read in Genesis, I believe it's or 26, or where it mentions Ada's name again. You see, she has a different name. And I forget what the name is, but the translation of the name is, means spice. So you see that Esau changed her name because this name had nothing but a bad significance on it. Ada. So he, he's like, oh, man, I can't have a wife named after, you know, Lamech's wife because that's that's bad. You know, that's bad juju, man, for us here. I got to change this girl's name. And, and so he changes her name. And you'll see it later on in another ge genealogy through the scripture. You'll see her name changed. Because why? Because the flesh does that kind of stuff. It changes the name of things that, that are to be called what, what they are. And I was reading a, a, a comment on that. It was pretty interesting. You know, it's where you get this whole thing about, you know, softening these words that we use today. You know, um, oh gosh, we could think of so many of them where, where the world just basically calls one thing, you know, uh, when it really is something. You know, like you're, you're looking at, you know, well, it's not really, I wouldn't call it divorce i'm calling it more of a separation type thing you know or i i'm not you know you, you you soften all these different things you know and that's what the flesh wants to do it wants to label things differently it wants to say no this is what god is going to call compromise that's what compromise is well no i call it just kind of you know relaxing time no that's compromise no it's relaxing time okay see the flesh wants to do this it wants to label all these different things and it wants to say, no, I, don't, I can't have this identified this way, man. And, and, and I want it to be justified. And so I, just right off the top in reading this, I'm like, there's so many examples that we're going to see of the flesh. We're going to see Esau. We're going to see these types of things that this, this whole explanation of what we're going to see here describes almost every one of us and all the different facets of how we live. Dealing with this wretched man that exists in every single one of us. So now I'm going to kind of skip down a little bit, and I'm not going to try all these names, man. <laughs> Pastor Jeff does. I, you know, even though he tears them up, he still does it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to try it, man. So, you know, the Lord knows my heart. I, I'm not trying to, you know, skip scripture or whatever. I'm just not going to do it. So go down to verse 5. And this big old name guy, <laughs> there, Jeush and Jalem and Korah, these are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. Now, I, I wanted to highlight this scripture because that's interesting. Um, here are all these names. Here's these, these families that are coming forth from Esau in the land of Canaan. Now, what does it mean to find things born in the land that God said, I don't want you to have any part of these people. I don't want you to intermarry. I can't have things. Well, you know what's happening here is he's establishing sort of a, a legacy here. And that's what he started to do. Esau began to, de to develop uh, something that was going to now birth forth what we are going to find later on as enemies of God. So what happens when we start to tamper around a little bit, when we start to allow for, for these little things to change, these little compromises, these things that God has clearly identified to us as big things to not do, and we go ahead and, and, and allow them to come in? Well, guys, we start gathering ourselves a little, a little family of sin. We gather a little a little bunch of things that that now are, are growing into things that are going to start to birth other things and it's going to start to just spread. This to me is, is one of the one of the, the greatest areas of, of of where the enemy lies to us, because the enemy wants to get in real slow and, and get you to, to change the name of things, maybe to get you to 
to compromise in some little areas here and there. So that, that way it'll birth forth this big old group of sin. And, and, and then as soon as you know it, this little kind of life you're living with the Lord, maybe you have some little things on the side that don't really seem to bother anybody, but you know it's things that you shouldn't be doing. Dude, right away, all of a sudden, boom, you get slammed with a major problem in front of you. All of a sudden, what, what was small little compromises has, has grown into a massive problem. A massive problem. And, and you start blaming God. Or we start to, we start to freak out because we don't understand how it got to this point. You start to say, Lord, I, I thought I was a Christian, man. I've been walking with you and going to church and all this stuff, Lord. How can I have a situation like that coming my way right now? I thought I was your son. Why, why all of a sudden am I dealing with this major thing? Well, because you know what was happening over here? Was it was just piling up. It was just birthing other things until it's full grown. And that's what the enemy does. It's a strategy of Satan. It, quiet stuff going on over here. And then all of a sudden, bam, it's right in front of you. And you're panicking. And maybe some of you brothers been there. I've been there where now you're saying, man, am I even saved? What's going on in my life, man? I thought God was victorious. I thought I was supposed to be walking in freedom. I'm, I feel like I'm in bondage all of a sudden. And, now, and you do. You, you honestly feel you're, 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 you start doubting in, in yourself and you say, man, I've been a believer. How am I in bondage all of a sudden? Well, it, it didn't happen overnight. It just didn't happen just like that. Guys, there's... It's that whole thought of you give the enemy a toehold, he's going to take a foothold, you give him a foot, you can take a leg, and sooner or later you're in a stronghold. And now, now all of a sudden you're, you're, you're strapped down. You have no freedom. You have no victory. You don't have any peace from the Lord. You're failing over and over again. And, and you're, conf you're walking down to get saved again because you just you don't know what hit you. But guys, we have these examples to show us that... Honestly, these things come our way because we allow them in. We let these things into our lives. Esau purposefully and knowingly compromised on, a, on one end with wives and intermarrying and all these different things. And later, did he, did he honestly think he was going to become the notorious enemy of God? You know, you don't think about that, right? I'm sure he wasn't sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, one day my whole family is going to be like the worst enemy of God throughout the whole scripture. He wasn't thinking that. We don't, we don't think that. But see, that's the subtle, quiet, slippery slope of temptation. And guys, that's why we have to really watch it, man. We have to really ask the Lord to give us discernment. Really ask the Lord to show us any area of our lives that we might be compromising in. And, and it might be hard to get rid of some things at first. It might be hard to let go. But you know what? It's the fruit that's going to be produced from somebody living in obedience to the Lord is going to be far greater than that temporal satisfaction or temporal gratification that you're receiving at that moment. Sin is only fun for a season. That's it. It's only fun for a moment. It's only temporal. I was listening to a message the other day and, you know, talking on uh, mental stuff. And uh, he, he talked about a lot. Of, and again, I'm not I'm just sharing with the message. He talked a lot about people who get on pills for whatever, whatever reason. I like it was a simple thing he said. He's like, hey, man, the pill don't heal. I'm like, that's right. The pill don't heal, man. The pill doesn't heal nothing. It, it gives you a moment of, of, of calmness and a moment of temporal peace for a second. But it's not healing anything. Only God can heal. And, and that process might be a kind of a long one, man. Might be a long process. But the healing will come. So look at verse 6. Esau took his wives. And his sons and daughters and all the persons of his, of his house. This is an interesting thing. And his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had gotten in the land of Canaan. And he went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than they might dwell together. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. See, I like that little explanation at the end there. Now, David said, Lord, why does the wicked prosper? And yet I'm over here just in misery. You know, how, how can, how can the, the people that are not of God, you just see them living life, man. Just loving it, man. They're, they're all the famous people. They ain't got no problems about money. You know, they, they must be living in peace. 
you know, kind of a side note, and I always tell my wife to watch what she watches on Netflix, you know, so don't think I'm, I'm condemning my wife. But she was watching this thing on Lady Gaga, right? It was some, some documentary or something. And, and I go home and I'm like, what, what is he watching? You know, and oh no, it's just a documentary on Lady Gaga. I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, kind of weird. So I started watching a little bit and she lives this lavish lifestyle, you know, to, her, her number one fulfillment in life was to be able to be, um, uh, be a part of the Super Bowl or something like she did a Super Bowl thing or something. And, uh, but then in the, in the documentary, you hear her often say, uh, she breaks down and cries and she's like miserable and she has all this pain and all this, uh, mental problems and the girls, the poor girl's a mess, man, a mess. You know, but then you see her, it's a perfect picture because then you see her go out like whatever, she's going to something and you see like thousands of people just love this girl. You know, they're, 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 they're like, you know, like you see when Michael Jackson, they're crying when they see her and, and they're just, you know, she's getting all this, like, and then she's got, you know, she's going in every sweet ride you could think of, man. She has all, every car you could think of and you just, you see what it looks like, but then you see how miserable she is. And, and how many times do we hear of all these other stories of these people we see that had a life that would seemingly be, you know, a life of peace or whatever, and they're killing themselves. Suicide. They're miserable. Esau, he had a lot of money. He was a very wealthy person. He had everything so much that he could not dwell on the same land that his brother dwelled on. That's how much stuff they had. You see, but you see God creating that dividing line within this. God is saying, Jacob will be over here and Esau, you are going to be Edom. And yes, you're going to have plenty. You're going to have everything because the people, you know, guys, let's just say it, the world to their own selves, they got everything. That's, and that's why Jesus said it's, it'll be harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? Uh, or be the, how did you say it? The same as a needle or whatever. Put a camel and a needle or something. Some crazy analogy. Camel, camel like, through the eye of a needle. Uh, yeah, camel through the eye of a needle. I mean, like, what does that even mean? But that's why he's saying that. Because people who think they have everything, and they have, they have no need of nothing, man. But that's a lie. That's a lie. And, and David, I, 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 I say amen to David where he says, why does the, why do the wicked prosper? Because sometimes I feel like, and this walk that we're in, guys, can be really difficult at times. Sometimes it gets kind of hard, you know, and, you're, and then you see somebody in the world just driving their car, smoking a cigarette, looking all happy, jamming to some oldie. You're like, man, how is this guy just loving life over here? And I'm listening to a worship song all broken and crying. And I can't even get my sanity back. What, what's the Lord? Why is the wicked prosper? Yeah, I'm over here just freaking out. How does this make any sense? But you know what, guys? It's, it's, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's flesh. And the end of the flesh is ultimate destruction. And all of that, Jesus said, is going to, is going to not matter in the end. Moth and rust are going to destroy all of these things. And that's why we have to really pray and ask the Lord to give us our eyes to be set on the things of eternity and of his kingdom. That's why he said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Because we got to get our eyes on his kingdom. And then those things that we need, and or at least think we need, they'll be added unto us. we got to believe that. We have to walk in faith. So verse 9, he says, And these are the generations of Esau, the father, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. And he names Esau's sons uh, from the son of Adah, the wife, the girl that we said that he changed his name, her name. Of Esau, Ruel, the son of uh, that girl there, and the other one, in verse 11, and the son of Elipaz, where these guys, okay, verse 12, um, this is the one I'm getting to. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. And that's interesting because now we come to Amalek, in which, as I mentioned before, we, we've done an entire study on. Amalek is a very interesting figure in the scripture. The Amalekites are the people that attacked God's children on their way through the wilderness. And the way the story goes is that it tells us that the Amalekites crept up 
behind the children of Israel while they were walking, trying to go through safe passage to the promised land, and they crept up from the back and they attacked the hindmost of the people, the weak people, the elderly, the children, the, and, and they attacked them uh, to, to basically prevent them from entering and any further into the promised land. So that story, as, as we read it, comes to us as Bible readers and it says something real simple. The Amalekites are an example of the flesh. They attack us at the weakest point of our lives or when we're weak mentally or spiritually or tired physically. And they come from the hindmost part of our lives to destroy us and to prevent us from going forward into the promises that God has for us. That's the picture of the Amalekites. That's the son of the wife that Esau had to change her name. That's the type of flesh. So you see, within Esau's whole family structure, we're seeing a picture of a satanic origin of the flesh. So much so that God says in this scripture that we are to remember Amalek. We are to remember Amalek. God, that, that's one of, the, one of those very few places you see in the Bible where God's going to say, remember something. You know, like when, when God says remember something, we got to remember it. All right. Don't, don't, don't. If he says remember, we have to take it seriously. And one part of this in the scripture, he says, remember Amalek. Remember this guy right here because of what he did to my people. Because I don't want you to forget that this type of person, this type of flesh, this, this moving of satanic origin exists all throughout the rest of the scripture. And all throughout our lives, where you see Amalek rearing in our lives constantly. And we have to remember that. And the, the Bible goes on to show us, and I'm saying, for the sake of time, I'm not turning there. But the Bible goes on to show us, and I think I might have talked to this, and, I, and I've shared this before, where somebody didn't remember Amalek. And that was Saul. Saul went to war with the Amalekites. And he was supposed to destroy every single one of them because God said from generation to generation, I'm going to go after this family. Isn't that crazy? For generation to generation, God said, I'm going after this family. And so way later, fast forward to the future, Saul now is at war with the Amalekites. And God says, remember Amalek and Saul, I want you to wipe them out completely. I want you to kill every last one of them because I'm at war with his family. <laughs> okay, because of who they are throughout the scripture. And Saul, well, doesn't destroy them. He kills almost all of them, except for the king and the cattle and all these other things. A few other things he wanted to keep, thinking that, oh, this might be good for my people. I can use this for sacrifice. He thought he can actually sacrifice something God hated. And so God now, that's when Samuel goes to Saul. And you guys know the story. He tells Saul, that's it. You're, you're done, man. You, you, you disobeyed the Lord. You disobeyed the Lord. And the anointing of God is going to be off of you. And it's going to go on to somebody else. That's how serious it was. And Samuel, the bro, grabbed a sword and shanked up that king. I mean, the prophet, he's killed him right there. Because he knew God's word and he knew, understood the repercussions to it. This, these people, these stories that I'm mentioning quickly, are all from the line of Esau. They're all from this, this heritage of Sin, And this, they're all from this line of flesh. So when we see what the flesh produces, man, we have to be a little concerned about it. And we have to ask ourselves, okay, Lord, so if, there, if, if, there, if it, there's nothing good that dwells in me, what am I supposed to do about that? What, Lord, what, what, do, you see, what do you want me to do? How, how am I supposed to, to deal with this? Well, I want to turn it real quick to Romans. And you can turn there with me. Chapter. Where are we at here? Chapter uh, 7. Verse, and, I'll, and I'll start at verse 18. He says... For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, and I mentioned this a minute ago, not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. 
Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 21, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And here it is. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And that's when he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What can I do about it then? If, if this is the case, if I'm, if I'm plagued with this flesh, this self, that's then for the rest of humanity, from the very beginning of time, using Esau as the example, to the rest of humanity, us together today, with our flesh being this prevalent, dominating, our flesh being this wicked and hard, Paul saying, well, what can I do? How, what am I supposed to do now? And he goes on to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the, serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he draws a line. He draws a line within himself. And he says, well, this is the reality that I have. My mind, I serve the law of God. My flesh to the law of sin. Now, I'm going to be careful here doctrinally. Chapter 8, verse 1. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That word condemnation, it means there's no guilt. Because of this reality, because of what he's saying about the flesh waging war against the spirit and the fact that none of us can change that, he's saying there's no condemnation then for you because you now are sort of this divided person inside that has a war. So because God recognizes that and has revealed that to Paul, he's saying now you can't be guilty or don't feel guilty about it. Don't condemn yourself about it. Don't go and say, well, then, you know, forget this. I can't do this. I have this, this war inside me and my flesh wants this and my mind wants that. Well, forget this. I can't do that. He's saying, no, there's no condemnation. God's not blaming you for the perplexities that exist within us. He's not, he's not blaming us for the imperfections that we have. He's just simply saying, you have them and you need to know that. You need to know that you're an imperfect person, but don't go and condemn yourself for it. You need to know that you're not going to be the strongest of persons you always want to be. But don't go and condemn yourself for it. Don't blame yourself for it. It's already written. It's right there. It's a done deal. And so we have to receive that. We have to be able to understand that, yeah, man, there's this struggle. But you know what? The reality is, is there always going to be one. There's going to be one. Guys, it, nobody's going to all of a sudden, nobody's sitting in this room going, well, I only have like 5% flesh and 95% spirit. No, no, I'm sorry. No, you don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You are 50-50, man. You're, you're the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. whatever that guy is. We're, we're all insane inside, right? But he says in that verse 1, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see, that's where we say, well, Lord, then... Empower me by your spirit. I need that faith. I need that strength. I need by not by might, but but not by my power, but by your spirit. Then I need it because my flesh. So, guys, when we're struggling and we're at a point of inner battling, you just you recognize for what it is. That's your flesh, and you say, "Man, that thing's lousy. Man, this thing inside me is hard, hardcore, wicked, and evil at times. Think some evil stuff." When I became a Christian, I, I thought more evil stuff when I got saved than before I was saved. Now I think of the evilest of things, man. I'm like, what happened, you know? Because now the flesh, you're seeing it for what it really is. And it's, and it's really trying to mess with you. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So, yes, we're stuck. We're in, this, we're in this fight with the Esau, with the Edom, with the, with the Amalekite, with the flesh that lurks in us. But you know what? We've been set free. We've been set free. I want to read uh, scripture, Philippians chapter 4. I was talking about it a little bit earlier. Verse 7. And he says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, 
Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, <clears throat> if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So we have to actually now tell ourselves to think of better things. Seriously. Don't think when your flesh throws a thought in your mind that's evil. You have to actually say, no, I'm not. I got to think about something different. I have to think on something that's praiseworthy. I, I have to actually get myself to think differently. It's, it's pretty weird, man. It, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing. You know, this, this walk that we're in because it's a lot of it is up here. It's in the head. And that's where the warfare is. But that's where the victory is. But I want, to, I want to finish on this scripture. I'm not going to re read the rest of the chapter. That'd be crazy. <laughs> I, want, I want to go to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 41. And this is, hopefully this encourages you. Because, you know, we're broken people. Guys, that's the summary of what we're reading tonight. We're broken people with this enemy that exists in every single one of us. But I love what the Lord says here in Isaiah chapter 41, starting at verse 10. He says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. He goes on to tell him, he says in verse 14, fear not thou worm Jacob. He calls him a worm. I love that. He calls him a worm. I'll tell you what, man, I know what, some of us know what it feels like to be a worm. Okay, you ain't got nothing, man. You don't have no strength. You ain't got no victory. You ain't got nothing. You got no legs or arms or nothing. You're a worm, he tells Jacob. Uh, you men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And watch what he says. Behold, worm. He says, think of the worm. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Hey, Amen to that. I'm going to transform you from a little worm to something that has teeth, all right? To something that ha ha is a sharp instrument. And thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. He's saying, I'm gonna make you strong. I'm gonna make you strong. But you know what, really? The reality of this verse here is you gotta first become a worm. You gotta realize you have nothing. You gotta realize that you're powerless, man. And that this flesh of ours is very powerful. And yes, Satan, he's, he's ruled it for some time. All of us were under the rule of Satan before we became under the rule of the Spirit. Every one of us. And sometimes it's still, it has those memories. But you know what? The Lord is going to come to us. We're going to be as a one. We're going to be as a defenseless person and say, Lord, save me. And he's going to say, I'm going to uphold you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be your God. And in the meantime, after you're weak and after you have nothing else like a worm, I'm going to give you teeth to bite. And if you read this chapter, he goes on to say that then the enemies are going to be gone. He talks about them never being found again. They're going to be as nothing, he says. So not only is he saying, I'll take you from being humble. I'm going to give you strength. And then that which has been turmoiling you, that, that which has been uh, taunting you, that which has been fighting against you so much, it'll be as nothing. It'll be as nothing. I'm going to give you victory over these things. And guys, we're going to have different victories through our whole life. First victory might be over one struggle you have. The next victory might be over a different struggle you have. You might even have a struggle you don't know you have yet. But God will show you. And then we're going to continue to receive these victories. And that's what we got to think on. Think on those things. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you for your promises, Lord. And, and that's exactly, Lord, even now, even, I know, even as our, our thoughts drift, we pray, Lord, that you would cause your spirit. Jesus, you said that the Holy Spirit is going to come and it's going to teach us and remind us of all these things you've taught. And so, Lord, we pray that you would supernaturally intervene in our thoughts and in our minds. Lord, that you would, you would cause us to see you and your, the testimony of your righteousness and of your power. And we want to experience that, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, in the areas we've allowed our flesh to prevail. Forgive us if there's areas that we've compromised a little bit. Maybe some things we've done in our walk that maybe we've changed the name of sin and 
allowed it to be justified. Forgive us tonight, Lord. Reveal these things to us, Lord, that we wouldn't get caught up to, to where all of a sudden we're just totally in a stronghold. Lord, we don't, you don't desire that for us. You desire for us to be worry-free, to live in the freedom that you have, Lord, is what we desire. So help us, Lord, to see, help us to get there, help us to hear from you and to obey it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.